Hello, I'm Jane Fuller, co-director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. We've done probably not far short of 150 videos now since lockdown um, in mid-March. And we've built up quite a body of work, actually stretching back way before then, on sustainability, whether that's from the investment point of view or from the public policy point of view. Um, I often start these discussions by saying it's a subject dear to my heart, and I usually say that when it's something really obscure about corporate governance or auditing or something. Um, in this case, of course, ESG, environmental, social and governance reporting, is a subject that is now dear to everybody's heart, uh, so dear that um, barely a week goes by without some pronouncement from either a body or a collection of bodies about how companies should report on what they're doing about ESG. Um, and of course, it comes with a bewildering array of um, initials from GRI, PRI, those sorts of initiatives right through to all the bodies, whether it's SASB, IFRS Foundation, whatever, who are, might actually play a role in setting standards. So um, the need for some sort of standardization of the way companies report on this is absolutely clear because there's um, such a, a bewildering array, as I said, of initiatives. Um, but it's not that easy, partly because ESG itself covers um, a multitude of, one can't, one can't say sins, a multitude of virtues, I suppose one might say. Anyway, I'd like, I've got a great set of people here to discuss the issue, um, starting with Veronica Poole, who's partner and global IFRS and corporate reporting leader at Deloitte. Um, she chaired the Accountancy Europe uh, task force that proposed a broader role for the international standard setter. Um, she's also a member of the uh, FRC's Corporate Reporting Council and of the um, International Integrated Reporting Council. And then we have Paul Lee, who's worked in investment for about 20 years, principally at Hermes and more recently at uh, Aberdeen. Uh, he, he advises fund managers, asset owners, and so on on stewardship, ESG and responsible investment. And he worked on uh, last year's report uh, by Sir Donald Bryden, in, Bryden into the quality and effectiveness of audit. Ben Yeo, is a senior portfolio management manager for RBC Global Asset Management, and he sits on the investor advisory group for the FRC. He also chairs the Responsible Investment Advisory Committee of a leading uh, UK sustainable investment trust and sits on the International Accounting Standards Board's uh, management com commentary advisory group. And we also have Chris Fiddler, who's a senior director Global Industry Standards at the CFA Institute, which is the International Financial Analysts Organization with which both um, Ben and I are associated as well. And it's published a series, as it's published a set uh, of proposed ESG reporting standards for investment products. Uh, before the CFAI, Chris was a management consultant at Thought Logic. So um, Veronica is going to kick off. Um, so over to you. Thank you, Jane, and hello, everybody. Um, 20 years ago, IFRS Foundation was formed, and the ISB came about, and since then, our world had never really been the same. The world of financial reporting was very much transformed, and I had the joy of living through that transformation and have the observations that I would like to share with you today in respect of what we have seen in the world of financial reporting and how that may indeed translate into some of our thinking around the world of sustainability information and sustainability reporting. So when we introduced the IFRS Foundation and when the ISB came into existence, we very rapidly moved from the what was a very fragmented jurisdictional standards landscape to a globally consistent financial information with more than 140 jurisdictions now using the financial reporting standards as written by the ISB. So we now take it for granted that virtually the entirety of our financial market ecosystem uses that information and relies on that financial information. So I think 
we are now at that same tipping point for sustainability information. And we have very much an urgent need and a unique opportunity to bring about global sustainability standards. I think this is a critical step if we are to meet sustainable development goals and in fact have a fighting chance on climate change. So, but why is that? Why do I believe in that so firmly? Well, it's because Fundamentally, I think that reliable, consistent and comparable sustainability information is what we need in order to be able to direct capital to sustainable enterprise and to make our markets more resilient and efficient. The other question is why standards? Well, that is because in order to achieve acceptance of any reporting requirements, we need an approach that is effectively based on some of the key principles independence, transparency, public accountability, and thorough due process. What we also need is a rigorous independent oversight and appropriate links to public authorities to give the process, to give the standards, if you wish that legitimacy that allows those standards then to be taken by a legislator or regulator in a jurisdiction as the law in the land for that jurisdiction. And this is what gets us to high quality standards. We need appropriate process to develop them and we need appropriate legitimacy. Why do we need high quality standards? Well, I think that's obvious because that's what gets people to coalesce and accept those standards. And that also can be then the basis of that broader ecosystem development where that information can be assured, it can be relied on, it can be used in many different ways by various market intermediaries. So what have we seen more recently? I guess it's quite interesting. So particularly this autumn has been rather eventful. As Jane was saying a minute ago, I mean, not a day goes by without yet another relevant development. And we have seen some groundbreaking developments that are taking us closer to the outcome that can be the global sustainability standard outcome. So let me highlight three that I think are the most significant moves that we have just seen. So the first one is the consultation by the IFRS Foundation trustees, which I think is a complete and utter game changer. It proposes the introduction of a new sustainability standards board, which would sit alongside the ISP, and it will be subject to the same governance and oversight uh, of the IFRS Foundation trustees. It will focus on standards for financial capital providers, i.e. standards for capital markets. Now, I think that is an extremely useful move because the IFRS Foundation is very well positioned to take on that global sustainability standard setting role. Why? Well, once again, it has a successful track record with financial reporting. It is operating very much under what I would describe as a unique model where we have private sector, independent, high quality standard setting process, which is overseen by public authorities. So their institutional architecture, in fact, is designed to deliver high quality standards that are based on the principles that I referred to. Now, the second development is the work of the leading sustainability standard setters, CDP, CDSB, GRI, IRC, SASB. That's tons of acronyms, but these are the five leading sustainability standard setters and framework providers that are out there. Their standards, their frameworks are being used and they are probably the most well set up organizations that have the wealth of the knowledge and sustainability standard setting experience. So this work of collaboration between the five is being facilitated by Deloitte. And so I have the privilege to participate in these discussions and it is facilitated together with the World Economic Forum and the Impact Management Project. So the five organizations have stated that they are ready to work together. They are ready to work with the IFRS Foundation and IOSCO to bring about the global sustainability standards. And in their statement of intent that they published in September, what they did show is how their standards complement each other rather than conflict or contradict each other, which I think is misperception in the market that currently exists. 
And they also showed how their existing standards could form the starting point, if you wish, um, for the technical content, for the new global sustainability standard setup whoever they are, whether they sit under the IFRS Foundation or whoever. But that willingness to work with the IFRS Foundation, I think, is extremely important. Now, the final development that I would highlight is the IOSCO open letter in response to the standard setters. And in that letter, IOSCO clearly states that it can and it is willing to play that role of an accelerator the same way that it did 20 years ago for financial reporting standards. Now, collaboration between IOSCO, the IFRS Foundation, and the sustainability standard setters can provide all the key ingredients of the solution for the sustainability standards for capital markets that I think we need. Can we do it quickly? Well, I think indeed we can, and I think we all recognize the need for agency, uh, but how do we do it? I think that's a very important question to address. And the approach that the constituents advised us on when we consulted on our Accountancy Europe vision for this integrated approach to standard setting was to use what they referred to as building blocks. So applying that sort of approach, what you would do, you would first create a block that creates a solution for global capital markets. Investors and capital markets need high quality, consistent sustainability information, and they need it urgently. And that block indeed can be very quickly created under the IFRS Foundation umbrella. The second block of standards should address reporting on impacts of a company on people, planet, and economy more broadly. So in Europe, in the NFRD, we already yeah. recognize that company impacts, you know, people, planet, economy more broadly, and we capture that through the concept of double materiality. And the third one, Charlie, just sorry to hurry you up, but we've got three other speakers. Yes. And to meet its policy objective, of course, Europe can then take that second block. And then the final block, of course, you could add if, for example, they wanted any jurisdiction wanted to meet specific policy objectives, then they can add that third block. So to conclude, all I was going to say is that we have now a unique window of opportunity and sustainability disclosure is now critical. So we need those sustainability standards, we need it in the mainstream, and we need it to be connected to financial reporting. But it took us 20 years to do that yeah. for financial yeah. world, so we don't have 20 years now. Yes, and um, each standard, having been involved in the painful process, it takes some years to develop each standard. Um, I'm, I'm bursting with questions, but I really want to bring in other people. So, uh, Paul, um, um, and I'm sure you'll start to respond to that. Yes, thank you, Jane. And, and, and I guess um, what I wanted to, to focus on, at least in, in my initial comments, was perhaps a, in part a, a response to that challenge of um, it's going to take us a long time to move forwards in, in these ways that, that Veronica's talked about, important as they are, um, it will take us a good time to build those building blocks and to and to construct um, the the building that, that comes from them. And and therefore, for me, um, actually, the most exciting um, initiatives or, or um, statements in this uh, in this space are not the the new initiatives, the the shiny new. It's actually statements from our existing standard setters. Um, and, and both the IASB nearly a year ago now and the IAASB, the audit standard setter, um, this summer have made um, statements about climate change. And each of them have said that, in effect, climate change is already built into existing mm -hmm. standards. And, and the mechanism for doing that or their argument for, for why that is the case is because they have uh, a materiality standard. Um, what is material to the main users of accounts, uh, investors, uh, is what needs to be disclosed. And uh, both the, the accounting standard setter and the audit standard setter have said climate change is material to investors. It will change the way in which uh, they make their investments and therefore 
those issues are already embedded, included um, within uh, IOS standards and within the accounting standards uh, that, that need to be applied. So very excitingly, we already have an expectation now that climate issues should be built in to, um, to the numbers that, that companies produce and, and that we should see uh, the relevant assumptions in that space um, so that so that we as investors can interrogate um, those assumptions and potentially substitute our own if we don't think they're the right assumptions. Um, the most obvious assumptions would be a, a future oil price or a future price for, for other fossil fuels and uh, future assumed lives for um, major assets and investments such as power stations or, or, or um, other investments that, that may become stranded in certain policy scenarios. And getting visibility on those assumptions will allow us, as I say, to, to challenge and interrogate um, what companies are doing. And actually, it will help companies to think through more fully what their future strategies are and, and whether their investment plans are the right ones make sense in relevant um, scenarios for for the future of our planet, and I think that's that's fascinating and really important for for climate. I think it's also a really interesting model for reporting more generally because um, as other aspects of ESG become seem to be material to investors, they too might get included and encompassed within. Um, existing financial reporting standards, and so although these these new initiatives are really important, actually some of these issues will already be embedded within the existing standards. Yeah. I think um, this materiality issue is um, obviously key. Um, I'm always rather depressed when I read company accounts, and it says the material. Materiality threshold is 5% of pre-tax profits. And I'm thinking, no, it's actually anything that might, as you say, change um, the way that an investor invests, allocates their capital. So, um, it, and so of course, anything that's going to affect future cash flows, you've given some good examples, could do that. Um, just um, want to ask um, you and uh, perhaps just come back to Veronica for a minute. Um, so, so you've been describing how um, actually the, there's a mechanism for embedding um, e, e and S into financial reporting standards uh, because of materiality and because of forward-looking um, uh, calculations that uh, give you answers on valuation. Um, but we've also got probably two leading sets of standards from the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board in the US and the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Um, so do, do we need to in, reinvent the wheel or have, uh, um, Veronica, have those two actually made a good, a good start? And um, can we not just build on what Paul was saying about existing IFRS and SASB TCFD, which are all in the, in the tradition of uh, standards, financial standard setting? And Jane, we have an absolute huge experience already with um, you know trying to implement TCFD and trying to implement SASB standards. So I think we can comfortably say that we have got some useful material in both of those frameworks. But I think those two frameworks and SASB will be the first ones to recognize um, are not complete. And what we currently have is a set of standards that was developed through the right lens with SASB and with TCFD. But with SASB in particular, that was very much focused on different audience. It was very much driven by, uh, you know, US investor and US preparers, or they do have- Sorry, why, why would US investors and preparers be different from investors and preparers elsewhere? Well, I think you start with the very basic situation of how does, for example, regulated industry work, like water, here in the UK versus how it works in the US. And if you try to apply the SASB standards to a UK regulated utility, you will really struggle because the standards envisage a completely different set of KPIs. 
So we have to recognize some of the limitations of developing standards in a particular geography because it caters for the users and the stakeholders of that geography. I think we should always remember that. So they will need globalization. And they're also not complete. So you talk about SASB, they don't even talk about scope three emissions. It's not part of their terminology. So, you know, Paul here is talking about very much the importance of recognizing climate in the financial statement. Totally agree, but I do think we still need to report on emissions. And that does not get recognized in the financial statements. For that, we need a robust, comparable definition of what we mean by GHG emissions in various scopes, and we need to report them. And we need to report that front end and back end connected way, such that you can actually call out the greenwashing that is currently absolutely you know, flooding the system, which is extremely dangerous for financial markets. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure you're right that they're not complete. Um, so, Ben, um, you are the sort of classic user of company accounts. Um, you've, you've been analysing companies for, 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 for many years. Um, how do you come at this subject? Yeah, almost 20 are long enough to lose my hair, unfortunately. Um, so you raised two or three interesting points. Um, I'll touch upon, uh, upon a couple. So one is uh, materiality. Uh, and the second, I think, is the theory of uh, standardization and on a globalized uh, place. So uh, on the second point, globalization, I think in theory, it's a very good ambition to have. And one global standard setter where everyone can agree um, is uh, sounds really good and would be really good. Um, but I, th I think Veronica made a point about how long it took on the financial uh, accounting, but also said we've got to do it faster. Um, but I still meet accountants who can't agree on what is cash, right? Between different accounting standards, you kind of think, oh, cash is king and that, that. But when you've actually ever had to sort of transfer, particularly in the olden days when we had to like go from, say, uh, UK GAAP to IFRS, or in fact, some companies now going from Japanese GAAP to IFRS, you get very big swings in what you thought was something which is very well uh, defined, you know, cash and cash equivalents and, and things like that. So there still is enough debate within uh, financial accounts to, to make this quite an interesting uh, question. The second to which you alluded to is that investors and actually different sets of investors and different stakeholders, companies, companies, auditors and that have different views on what materiality is. Uh, and so this is a this is a question. In fact, this is why you have all of these calls and things and why you have the market, because what investors uh, in in their totality are, are, are doing are often voting with their uh, actual capital for saying what is material or not about companies, and that very often disagrees with uh, companies and and all their auditors and, and everyone involved. Um, the other thing about I guess uh, coming around to trying to say a, a global set, and so we had this theory, and Veronica mentioned uh, scopes, which uh, for those on the call know is, is how to account for uh, greenhouse gas uh, equivalent uh, emissions. And actually, there, there's still very little standardization there. So most of us probably haven't. I've I had the misfortune to trying to get to grips with what uh, a certain company scope three emissions actually were. And there's a very wide range of plausible scenarios that you can come for plausible uh, scope three emissions, which are, are generally for most companies in the sectors, not all, but a very large part of emissions. And actually globally, they probably account for maybe about 60% uh, of emissions as opposed to scope one and two, which are more direct emissions, which are maybe only 40%. Uh, but the natural capital uh, accountants and academics can't actually really agree on that. So even in theory, where you have some ideas of natural capital accounting, which could be important. So say water or carbon or greenhouse gas things, uh, there isn't yet uh, that much consensus as to how you would do it, which then raises these questions of audibility and com comparability as well. Uh, and although my illusion was that, say, cash is still, you, you still have a lot more consensus over that than you do over some of these things. And then I think the last point I'd raise is you still are going to have to separate out, I think, elements where you think you can get to actual data, say physical reported data. So say you can solve the question on carbon or waste, electronic waste, or water, and policies, and things like that. But you'll also have a section which is, is still probably going to be much more uh, opinion or judgment. You know, Some of these things over social capital still will be, to the extent that you can score, and you might have employee engagement, and things like that. Um, and I know there's talk about whether it's narrative or, or not narrative. 
uh, but there'll there'll still have to be some sort of uh, assessment and judgment, and that will also have cultural, regulatory, uh, geographic uh, differences, which we alluded to, uh, which I think will be very uh, very be interesting to see how that pans out. And you can already see some of this in the differences between how, say, rating agencies look at this and and investors and and different stakeholders, uh, and you know how auditors and and, re- and reports uh, look at this. And you can sort of also see this crystallized because credit rating agencies actually have a relatively high degree of um, convergence as to how they look at balance sheet items on on a company. Right? They can broadly agree, and that's broadly an outcome of agreeing on what a lot of these financial reporting is. Whereas if you look at uh, sustainability ratings, ESG ratings, or impact ratings, or any of that intangible, extra financial, non-financial, uh, pre-financial, see how we're using all of these different terms uh, around that, uh, there is very uh, little agreement. And actually, reasonable people can disagree as to the weights and materiality that they put on that. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a Gordian knot. Um, which we still haven't yet unraveled. And, and global standards can help to some extent, and they'll help with the actual unpacking of uh, data where we can agree upon the data. But the interpretation of that data, uh, like it is actually in financial statements, but probably to another order of magnitude, will still be uh, very readily available for debate. And I would just conclude that maybe that's a good thing, because actually, as we're trying to allocate capital to what are gray areas and where we want to allocate it, you know, broadly, capital markets want to allocate to to good ideas, uh, good things, and away from bad ideas, bad things. And the idea of capitalism is that the bad things go bankrupt, right, and disappear from the from the system. Um, that we will need some of that functioning uh, of that and all the players to come in, so we can get that process to work best. Yeah. So one thing um, is when I've sort of been reading about this, much of the sort of guidance or even regulations so far is uses the word describe, a company should describe what it's doing or what it thinks it's doing on some of these subjects. Um, So we don't, as you say, we haven't really got to the stage of identify, recognize, measure. Um, So isn't the the danger that you just get a pile more description? Um, And that, um, I mean, how much of it can actually be measured at the moment? So I actually think more can be measured than you think, but also, uh, you know, not everything that counts can be counted. That's another problem uh, that you have. <laughs> yeah. So you, you've got both, not everything that counts that can be counted, not everything that counts, uh, you know, should really be counted. And then you've got a lot of description, which is not really material for investors. So, you know, when you look at material risks, sometimes I look at 50 risks and they'll go, oh, there's commodity risk, oh, there's uh, currency risk. All of those are, are, are true, but then you actually lose the ones which you, you can really see which, which are there uh, within that. Uh, and I don't think that's a problem that, that we've necessarily solved. And then even when you measure it, so m- say you can measure, we can go back to these carbon in- intensity scopes, you know, scope one, two, and three, but then you've also got life cycle measurement, uh, you know where this is this is really tricky, uh, and then what you wait on that you know the classic one if you take it away from companies, but you know the life cycle measurements of for instance plastic bags versus uh, paper bags, how many times you reuse them, or even uh, my favorite example actually is hand dryers versus paper towels. Do you think of the uh, you can think of the energy cost uh, which actually is is lower for hand dryers, but you think of the hygiene cost is actually better for paper towels, and then you have waste. And then you have noise. So it, it really depends on what you're waiting. Pre-COVID, uh, you might have waited energy. Post-COVID, you're actually waiting hygiene. Yeah. So it's quite a complicated area. So this is where we get into the issue of um, you know different audiences as well, uh, yes. uh, more or less interested in different aspects. So Chris, uh, um, in terms of um, how um, analysts um, look at this, um, and perhaps have to take account of what non-analysts think about this, because it's obviously quite a politically charged area, uh, public policy area. Uh, how do you um, sort of sort out the wheat from the chaff here? Well, uh, first, good afternoon. Thanks for having me, Jane. I appreciate being part of the forum today. Um, and uh, I guess to answer that question, I would say that analysts are still primarily focused on, I think, the uh, the financial materiality uh, of this type of information. They're looking about how it is going to impact uh, their valuations and how it's going to impact the risk of uh, of the investment. 
Now, I think as, as Ben said, though, there's a very wide range of the types of information that you could look at. Uh, and reasonable people can disagree about, about what is material, about what could uh, become material. Uh, and I really liked what he said about this is why we have markets is because different people are looking at different information. Uh, they come to different conclusions and they use that information and, uh, you know, and, and, and that's how markets uh, can function efficiently. Uh, so it's, it's our position at, at CFA Institute that, uh, that analysts should look at all material information. I mean, we've always had that position. Uh, and it should be incorporated regardless of the type of, of fund or strategy uh, that's being designed. Uh, and so that, that doesn't change, right? What's changing here is, I think, one, the amount of data and the type of data that has become available. So I think some of the things that uh, are underlying that trend are uh, big data, we can collect more and more data the, in these last decades than we ever have. And secondly, we've become a much more, um, we've become much more connected globally. So whereas in the past, things that happened on the other side of the world may not have been uh, within our consideration set. Uh, nowadays, they very much are. So what we have here is not really a, uh, a change in position about how we should be using information, but I think largely it's about the information that's available for decision making. Yeah, but this, is it made absolutely clear to, to, to analysts when they're being trained that materiality is not just a quantitative issue? I mean, this has some sort of overlap with the um, conversation we were having the other day about brought in fiduciary duty and a possible setback in the US where there's still quite a lot of questioning as to whether um, a director's fiduciary duty, um, you know, to what extent that allows them to take into account factors other than what's regarded as the purely financial. And yeah, and, and I think uh, I think we're clear is that you know it should be taken into account, and that it it must be materiality must be taken into account. Um, but I'll go back again and say that depends on the type of investment you're looking at. It, I think it also depends on your strategy. It depends on your time horizon. Uh, it depends on a lot of things. So there isn't, a, you, you know, there isn't a black and white definition of materiality. And we have to rely, I think, on the, the judgment and the skills of investment professionals. Uh, and that is our aim is to give professionals that kind of knowledge and the frameworks to think through those issues. Yeah, and then of course they have to be transparent. Um, the products have to be transparent. Um, we haven't even, I think I think uh, Veronica mentioned, quite rightly mentioned greenwashing, so that's, uh, that's that has been a bit. Um, Veronica, just, um, I mean, you were very um, persuasive that, uh, that there's a lot in common already between the initiatives being taken, not just by SASB, TCFD, but by the likes of the, of the GRI. But I'm not sure how easy it is to combine what's called sort of double materiality or the triple bottle, bottom line, um, where you give the same priority, presumably, to people who are, to say, environmental campaigners, as you do to investors. Um, so doesn't isn't there a, isn't there going to be a conflict uh, depending on what the what the purpose is of the standards and which audience which uh, which set of uses that they're aimed at so jane audience absolutely matters as we already know with the world of financial reporting or even the consideration of the fiduciary duties audience does matter so I think it is extremely important to recognize that. The other thing that we need to recognize, and I think there have been already lots of references to the fact that actually materiality when it comes to sustainability matters is a dynamic concept. So something like with COVID, pandemic, whatnot, not material to me, you know, two years ago, a year ago, suddenly, boom, financial risk here and now. It's all, all over my financial statements, all over my viability as a business. So that's the first thing to recognize. The second thing to recognize, and the standard set has demonstrated that with their statement of intent that they published in September, is that materiality is a nested concept. So when you look at issues, sustainability issues, you actually start with a very broad set 
of what is material to people, planet, economy at large. So that's your classic impact-based materiality. That's when you talk about double materiality, the UNFRD has got the impact-focused materiality. So you start with that out box, and then you find the subset of issues that are material to enterprise value creation. When I say enterprise value creation, I do mean valuation. I mean the market cap in the financial markets. I do mean financial materiality, to Chris's point. These matters are material financially. They may not all be captured in the financial statements. And in fact, we know that less than 20% of value of companies is actually captured in the financial statements. So what is then recognized in the financial statements is another subset. So it's effectively like three Russian dolls, impact and the price value, and then recognized in the financial statements. So, and then what you have is then the company needs to decide, the investor needs to decide what's material to enterprise value creation. So once again, to Chris's comment, you will need to determine what it is at any point in time, and depending on your time horizons and your investment strategy, what do you think is important and material to you? Company will do exactly the same. And just like with the world of financial reporting, you will have a jolly good discussion, hopefully, around what is or what isn't material. Mm. So um, perhaps um, Paul and one or two others would like to come on a, on a sort of different angle on this, which is, um, as Veronica says, the concept of materiality is dynamic. Uh, one thing that's dynamic is public policy which is moving quite fast on um, e ES and G issues. Um, so, and a lot of what we're talking about is not just qualitative, but it's forward looking. So how, how can you factor in to something that's um, rigorous um, forecasts, um, not just of um, you know, what the company is doing to create value, value but there's um, the sort of, um, I hate the word externalities, but maybe it's appropriate here, but the very big externality, which is what, what public policy pay makers um, might impose um, going down the track, one, three, five, ten years. So, Paul, would you like to have a crack at that first? I, uh, I can have a go. I mean, I think, I think that's exactly why it's so important to, for companies to disclose the, their assumptions in, the, in these areas, because... Um, their assumptions will be based in a particular policy scenario, and and you know they have to pick one. That's that's what has to happen in order for them to develop a set of numbers. Um, hopefully, going forwards, we will get more disclosure around um, scenarios, risks, and and their potential impacts. I think I think. The, the whole dynamic of, uh, of corporate reporting is moving towards an understanding that life is dynamic and it and just having a single number actually is mm. sensitive than, than than having the shape of of where things might go but to to develop your financial accounts you have to pick one one version of reality. But if you at least then disclose the assumptions that you've used, we as investors can put in a different scenario, work out what might potentially be the impact of uh, a different range of policy dynamics that you know the world will need to change within the next 10 years. What might that mean for, for this particular company? But so that, um, so we've got those assumptions disclosed. We we yeah. can't do that, and and it's so that's that's vitally important. Yeah. So Ben, it sounds to me though that this is not describing the audited financial statements as we know it, Jim. It sounds as though it, a more appropriate approach would be a sort of Bank of England fan chart. Um, getting and the further out you get, uh, the wider the dispersion of possible outcomes depending on the assumptions, which um, you know Paul rightly highlights. Uh, so, but which would might be useful, but is it part of the financial statements, or is it part of the principal risk uh, narrative, or what? 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 It, where should that go? You asking me? Yes. So, so I'm going to draw an interesting analogy here between um, actual market practice. So, the report and accounts obviously still very important, and your annual check-in and public policy. You know, by the time it's developed and regulation and things comes out, it's also important giving you these guiding frameworks. Um, 
but I think I'm picking up on Ver Veronica's um, point about uh, a lot of these concepts not being time invariant, right? They move in that dynamic within time, within weeks, within days. And I think therefore what you're finding is that the regular updates, quarterly calls, or in fact, other real time ways of, of what companies are talking about are increasing in importance uh, as in the same time as we're getting stymied on some of this report and accounting um, uh, angles. And there you actually have much more up to date. So in fact, uh, for instance, companies have given much more up to date uh, reports and accounts or not or the official reports and accounts, but an accounting of how they've handled COVID, right? And a lot of that around. Um, and we're not going to have the backward looking report on that until annual reports coming out next year. Well, so much Actually, water yeah. under the bridge would have <laughs> would have passed. Climate is obviously in some ways something different because it's, it's sort of longer term, but actually some of those incidences, a lot of those things happening now, you know, think we, you know, we've had issues with uh, mining sites, we have issues with, with those things. Uh, so actually as the world becomes more real time, more digital, more interconnected, um, actually ongoing reporting of some of these extra financials, stakeholders type things, and how that links into where you do your annual report and these regulatory framework, I think are going to become, in fact, they are more critical for investors now, and I think are going to be coming uh, even more so. Uh, and at the same point in time, as as if we don't move on the speed on reporting accounts and, and all of that, uh, investors will probably continue to pay uh, less and less attention to that and more and more attention to the real-time updates, what you get, the what investor relations might actually say uh, above and beyond. Uh, and you already see this a little bit with um, you know, the, the MD and D of, so this is the descriptive part in US reports is very legalese and much less helpful to investors than, than say listening into an investor day, uh, because it tends to be very compliance driven, uh, written by lawyers. Um, you know, it has to be audited in, in, in a certain way and the kind of materiality value part of what investors find really interesting is, is kind of diminishing there within time. So I, I wonder how that, how that works. And then I'll just throw another thing in, in this is there's a kind of um, interesting analogy here with what we're seeing between public and private markets, because the way that private markets are, are able to report or report differently is also opening up this divide as, as to where, uh, as to where we might be and, and how you're doing on, on these things. So, I, I I don't know where the answer is, but there is there is some of that sort of problems or or challenges coming through. Yeah, I just want um, to obviously so bring where it Chris sits. On. So, yeah. um, Chris, where um, uh, but please comment on what you've heard, but but also just one specific thing in terms of where should analysts be looking for this information? Um, and you know, it, do you agree with Ben that actually the sort of perhaps distinction between what's in in the audited financial statement and what's coming out uh, in all sorts of other material, whether that's, whether the balance has changed there. Yeah, uh, well, I'd like to touch on the, the point you made just a moment ago about uh, public policy, mm. because I believe it's really important to look uh, at these questions through the lens of public policy. So when you have, ex for example, in the EU, a an explicit public policy to reorient capital flows to sustainable activities, I think you're gonna end up with a different answer when it comes to standards than when you have perhaps different public policies elsewhere in the world. And public policy, I believe, is a reflection of the underlying cultural values of, of society and the kind of uh, world that people want to live in and their their preferences and their their hopes uh, for the future. So I do think that there's an important element there uh, and an important lens to look through to understand the differences in uh, in in how people might be approaching mm -hmm. standard setting uh, and choosing what types of metrics and and data to disclose, as well as how they assess. Uh, materiality. Uh, so in terms of, uh, of, of where analysts should look for this data, um, gosh, that's a, that's a really broad question. Um, there's so many places, I think, to look for it. Uh, I agree with what others have said about uh, the content of 
of financial statements. It's it's clearly not all there. Uh, it, an analyst needs to look well beyond the financial statements, I think, to um, to do their due diligence. Uh, and that means looking at other types of corporate disclosures. It means at looking at, uh, at third party data sources uh, from either the source itself, like, like government reports, filings, things like that, or data aggregators. Um, and I, I think it's perfectly fine also to, uh, to you know, purchase some of that from third parties and outsource some of that analysis uh, because it's quite difficult to um, be able to be an expert on uh, so many different industries, different areas. So I think we would just say that one needs to be very circumspect uh, and very diligent and to collect that information, do appropriate analysis and have then a solid, reasonable basis for making any investment decisions uh, or giving any investment advice. I might just jump in there and just say, there's another interesting effect with the power of uh, machines, so computer algorithms where obviously humans have set up the data that they're attracting, but actually this is where sustainability report and accounts was that could be uh, increasingly important because quantitative machines or even passive style investments or rules based are a growing portion of the investment market. Um, so there's less of this analysis being being done in some respects, and so the getting good data and how that goes in will be increasingly important for that part of the market, uh, which I think will be a very interesting trend to, to see. And they will use both report and account. They'll also use real-time data as well, right? So they'll use all sources, uh, but that will be fascinating to see how that yeah. goes through. Um, Veronica or Paul, is there anything you wanted to add to this just before I ask for your sort of closing, re closing remarks, which will involve look, using a crystal ball, of course. Is there anything? So if I may say, I think the annual report still plays a very important role. And I recognize that depending on the jurisdictions, um, you may have a different setup. Not everything is in, in a 10K or whatnot, but you need to look at what is your mainstream reporting. So if you look at what's in mainstream reporting, the reason why it's important to include this information in the mainstream, because what this does is provides the absolutely critical connectivity to the financial performance. So from a claim or a pledge or a strategy or a risk assessment to the cash flow projections that Paul is looking for, you know, is there consistency of assumptions between those pledges and the actual scenarios projected in the financial statements? How are you going to call it out otherwise? You know, that's the first thing to say. The second thing, of course, the standardization and reporting in mainstream, what that allows is assurability, better assurability, better comparability, and that, of course, gives the information credibility that the market actually often seeks. And I think that's a whole host of new questions that you could ask, Jane, no doubt. Yeah, I, 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 I wanted to ask a question about who audits this, but we haven't got time for it, sadly. But you, you've, you've just uh, sort of covered, the, uh, covered it. Um, so, Paul, was there anything you wanted to add to, in response to what you've heard so far? Well, I, I think it is just building on exactly that point, that, that it is vitally important that um, the disclosures in the narrative reporting do join up with the financials and um, that we don't get sucked into this situation of greenwash where people make these wonderful fine um, statements in, in the narrative reporting under TCFD or, or whichever of the standards they're reporting under, and then there is literally no linkage to the numbers that they're actually reporting. And, and it's vitally important for us as investors that there is consistency between those two elements, that management steps up to the plate and, and is fair balanced in how it reports and make sure that there is consistency and that auditors step up to the, the yeah. plate to deliver their role of assuring uh, consistency between the two ends of the report. I mean, they are, they are of course, um, they've long been um, supposed to look for inconsistencies between the front and back half, but, you're, but the more recent regulations and guidance have said the whole thing needs to be fair, balanced and understandable. And, you know, if you stand back, it needs to hang together. Um, right, so just um, sort of last question. So if we look ahead, I don't know, I hesitate to say one year in this context, but so let's say five or 10 years, 
where are we going to be? Are we going to have, um, is it going to be like financial reporting standards where we've got the US gap, the great monolithic US gap on the one hand and uh, IFRS on the other. And uh, of course, many of us will have been involved in the convergence uh, uh, efforts between those two sets of standards. Um, so will it, will it be those th those two uh, or will it even be one? Will the new, will the IFRS Foundation set up a sustainability standards board that will rule the world? Or will we go the way that we seem to be going now, which is that you've actually got it, it's quite fragmented according to the audience. Um, because actually different audiences have different priorities. Um, I mean, I'm completely with Veronica on uh, the financial, you know, financial statements, the relevance of all this information to value creation and therefore the financial statements and materiality. But if you're a human rights campaigner or an environmental campaigner, you're not bothered about profits, you're bothered about having a clean environment and, um, you know, nobody being paid to... Uh, you know, sort of slave wages. So you, know, you can see here much more scope for a continued fragmentation than even with the, than with financial reporting standards. So perhaps perhaps we'll sort of go from the radio dial right to left and leave Veronica the last word. So, uh, well, sorry, last word. So Chris, um, where where what's your view for five ten years out? Always, always risky to offer projections for the future. Uh, but I would expect that, uh, that the answer is both, that there will be greater harmonization, uh, yet there will still be uh, some significant fragmentation uh, in the standards. I, I think it does take a lot of time, and, and I think we'll, we'll have to exhibit some patience uh, what I expect to see is the areas that can be harmonized uh, more easily and, and, and that are um, perhaps more important. What I mean by that is that there's a consensus among uh, a large group of people that uh, this is this is important to be disclosed. Like those will we'll have, I think, greater harmonization around those areas. Uh, at the same time, I think there could be shifting priorities and things that that pop up that make other things more important and then someone will go off and you know, create some more standards around that thing. Um, so I think we'll see both uh, at the end, but um, you know, over, I think we'll see a trend. I think we'll see a trend toward more harmonization. Okay, and, and Ben, what, what do you believe? Yeah, I broadly agree. So I think there will be more uh, standardization on that global level. I think there might be, there could be one, one or two, as, as you indicated. And I think particularly under some areas where there's a lot of focus like climate and so on the carbon, there'll be much more standardization and where that, you know, there is a physical, geophysical process that we could probably agree uh, and get upon. But I also think that to your uh, um, illusion that there are these other stakeholders which might not be so interested in what might affect long-term cash flows or, or could be in a sort of more um, interesting way like human rights and, and those type of things. Uh, who wouldn't be satisfied with that. And so you'll have service providers, whether that's actually standards or not, which will cater to that type of uh, that type of reporting, uh, which, which will be, and I don't think that will go away. In fact, if anything, uh, that might continue to proliferate. Uh, but the, my, my other point, though, is also is in, there's some thought that in standardization, or even in an agreement with like this, uh, it might defeat some of the problems that we're having around uh, greenwashing and management and, and things like that and, and assessment. And also in terms of, oh, how can we allocate our money sustainably and things like that? I actually don't think standardization uh, will uh, impact greenwashing as much as we might hope. Um, there are very many uh, issues with, with how you do that. Uh, you know, managements can already do this with like all the debates around, you know, non-gap, you know, non-accounting standards type of metrics and KPIs, which is a whole argument which is which is going on. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's because markets and disease is, is a product of human nature and human behavior. And I, standardization, I think, is a good thing and it will go that way. But I actually don't think of it as the panacea uh, that a lot of people are are hoping for. It's not like, oh, we can standardize, we know how to do a sustainable development goal investing, and it will be done. It, it won't be as easy as that. Um, and Paul? So I, I would step back and just say what has driven the IFRS Foundation to make its SSB um, proposal, and that's because of the level of frustration that so many of us feel 
uh, the fragmentation of, of standards in this area. And, and that frustration, which is felt by investors, it's felt by corporations, it's certainly felt by the regulators, must mean that the drive for a, a, a single approach, a standardized approach, will will take us forwards and and will lead to um i think probably two sets of standards because we we all know that our american friends don't don't like joining in with the world always um maybe that will change but um i suspect it will be a couple of standard setters and and um we will be in much the same situation in the sustainability world as we are in the uh, financial reporting world. And, and Veronica, the last word is, is with you. Thank you. I, I'm an optimist. So I think we will have global sustainability standards for capital markets. I, I think sooner than five to 10 years, Jane, because I am an optimist. And I think we will have also made some significant progress in trying to measure impacts. So there is going to be a certain degree of standardization and harmonization evolution, if you wish, around impact measurement. But I think what we really need to remember in all of this, accounting or sustainability reporting is an art, not a science. It is an art. We can't get perfect, scientifically precise answers on sustainability reporting, just like we cannot do with financial reporting. And we must not, absolutely must not wait until we've perfected everything before we move. And therefore, I think we are at the turning point and I think we need to move fast and we have that unique opportunity to make a difference now. So we could have that definitive climate standard next year that requires all those things, but CFD reporting and what Paul is talking about vis-a-vis -vis financial reporting. That, that's my ambition. Yeah, the lack of reporting doesn't stop you doing the right thing, right? The yeah. report comes after the activity. If we get all the activities right, then let's hope that all goes well. Yeah, well, it's it's great to end on an optimistic note. And also, um, I'd like to thank you all for helping us actually in a very lucid way to uh, pick our way through what so many have regard, begun to regard as a bit of a minefield of uh, acronyms and so on. And, uh, you know, we think we've uh, come to a point which is rather more focused as well as optimistic. So um, thank you very, very much for all your contributions and your time. And uh, well, perhaps we should resume next year to see if Veronica's optimism was well-placed. Well